So, my name is Zach. I'm on the sales team at Casa. Uh, Kit here is putting on the Bitcoin 22 conference. And we've got Nick here, the CEO of Casa, who will be giving us all of his expertise and knowledge tonight. So, just to get a quick idea, how many of you all either are familiar with self-custody or like already use a hardware wallet? Just a quick show of hands. Good bit, a good bit. So, got a fairly uh, experienced crowd, so it should be uh, good info here. So, um, all right, I'm gonna turn it over to Kit and we'll get started. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for showing up. My name is Kit. I'm a digital marketer at the Bitcoin conference, so I'm super excited to share some details with you about that later. Um, but first off, I'm going to go through what money is, some history around it, and then some um, interesting facts about exchanges and why you should get your keys off of those. Um, do I hit enter to push? All right, perfect. Um, so this is our agenda, why self-custody of money is important. Um, then we're going to go into some ethos, some historical events, um, why you should do self-custody instead of leaving it on the exchanges. Um, we're going to go through single SIG and multi-SIG. I'm going to uh, hand that off to CASA to explain a little bit more about that um, inside of the CASA business. And then managing your private data, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. All right, so what is money? Money is a tool that you can use to trade. I have a good, you have a good, we wanna exchange it in some way. And so this can get complicated if you don't have some, some basic principles around it. Um, so um, we've got coincidence of wants is inefficient. So you can't just have something and wanna exchange it. Um, it doesn't scale very well. So there's five properties of, um, money that makes it really good and Bitcoin has most of these which is just amazing so we've got divisibility you can do, you can um, subdivide it and scale it so that um, it can do large transactions um, and I'll explain that in a little bit portable you can uh, quickly move it um, gold isn't easily moved you have to have a truck um, if you want to send something to Spain or across the world in a few seconds you have to uh, be able to do that really quickly. And it's either digital, instant, or you're gonna have to like fly it or ship it on a, on a boat or something like that. Um, then we've got that it's durable. Um, this is basically just resistant to physical damage. Um, dollar bills can rip. Um, coins back in the old day, apparently they would put them in bags and shake them and little pieces of coin would go at the bottom and they'd melt them and make more coins. Um, so you want something that's solid. Um, and then recognizable, um, this is basically just that it's easy to verify. Um, you'll see on dollar bills that they'll use markers sometimes to see that it's real. Um, and of course with Bitcoin, we've got the ledger to make sure we can verify it. Um, and then that it's scarce. Um, this is so that it's resistant to manipulation like we've seen with the US dollar and inflation. Um, it can hold its value as well too. US dollar has lost a bunch of its value since going off the gold standard. Um, and it prevents in inflation theft. So let's go to the next slide. Um, another one is that it can't be confiscated. With Bitcoin, you can hold your own keys. Um, there's been a lot of instances in history where um, that I'll get into, like this Cyprus bail-in, they just took a bunch of people's money out of their bank. Like if you had over $100,000 in the country of Cyrus, they just, they took 10% of it out of it and just overnight, they're just, that's insane. <laughs> um, and then we also have things like the order 6102, that was um, an executive order that you can't hoard gold or like gold certificates. Um, and that was by Franklin D. Roosevelt. So you never know what the government is going to try to do. Um, and so, let's see, the next thing I wanted to mention um, is, um, let's see, the last part. The last part is just kind of like money can be whatever you want it to be. Um, people have been using 
gold, we've used beads, sheet, seashells, and when you think about it in that sense and kind of open your mind past the US dollar, you can see that digital currencies mm -hmm. definitely the way of the future, um, especially since Bitcoin touches on a lot of the properties that I just mentioned on the last slide. Um, so Bitcoin and self-custody ethos, um, digital large amounts can be self-custodied. Um, so thinking in the terms of gold, like if you have a bunch of gold and you put it in your garage, it's just, it's not, um, it's not maintainable and manageable. So when you go digital, you can have like millions and billions of dollars on your cold card um, easily. Um, it also does that, um, helps a lot of the problems of central banking. Um, Bitcoin, you can access it 24 seven, um, whereas banks, they're closed on the weekends. Um, you can't always access your funds. Trying to do like remittance, fees are really expensive. Um, there's just, there's a lot of fees in banking in general. Um, so um, Bitcoin solves a lot of those problems. Um, another thing that we mentioned before um, about inflation, uh, Bitcoin has a 21 million coin cap, so there will never be any more than that. And um, it can be divisible for the scaling purposes, but the supply is set, so that helps it hold its value. Um, and then at, at 2040, all, most Bitcoin will be mined by then. Um, and then proof of keys days, um, I wanted to mention that because it um, started on January 3rd. Um, it's a day to remember to hold your own keys because um, if they're, you're not holding your own keys, someone can take it from you. A lot of exchanges have gone down and got liquidated and people have lost a lot of their coins. Um, so Trace Mayer started that on um, January 3rd to remind us all of that. Um, the, so we put together a historical event. Um, so we have the Bitcoin white paper was released. Um, we have um, seed launches and wallets were launched, um, some more uh, Bitcoin software. And uh, when we send these slides out, you, you guys can go in and uh, read the, all the articles that are linked on this. Um, I wanted to go into a little bit of the Mt. Gox hack um, for this. Um, so the exchange was liquidated and people lost all of their Bitcoin. Um, and also it happened recently, actually in September, recently 2021, 6,000 Coinbase customers' funds were stolen. Um, so if you haven't heard about that, that was a few weeks ago. Um, so these, these exchanges, they're getting hacked. Um, the CEO, Mark Kepler, was indicted for embezzlement for the Mt. Gox hack. Um, and at the time, 70% of Bitcoin transactions were being made through this exchange. So it was a huge exchange for this to happen to a bunch of people. Um, $460 million in crypto was lost and then 21 million in US dollars were lost. Um, it's just mind blowing that that can happen. So it's really important to get your keys off of these exchanges. <laughs> um, on this, we've got um, some companies that do custodial and then self custody, um, which is the best option to go. Um, with Coinbase, we, as mentioned on the last slide, 6,000 people were affected. Um, and some of these, you know, like BlockFi might be tempting, but the interest rate really isn't worth it when Bitcoin is doubling and tripling percentage wise year after year after year. It just doesn't make sense to hold it on those when the actual return, just holding it on your uh, cold card is what I use personally, um, also CASA. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Nick to explain a little bit more. Thanks, Kit. So I'm Nick, CEO of CASA. It's good to meet you all. And since a lot of you already self-custody and use hardware wallets, really my goal is to help, uh, one, understand multi-sig for the people who don't understand it, and two, really give people a... Um, story and some ammo to help 
your friends and other people that are new and getting into Bitcoin to understand why you should self-custody because it's something that as a community we really need to push for and to help people do in order to actually protect Bitcoin as a whole. And I'll get into to why in a little bit here. So one of the things that I get asked a lot is why won't people just use Coinbase? Why won't everybody just keep their, their funds on Coinbase instead of holding their own keys on kind of a long enough time horizon? And one of the things that has been really become very clear lately is that the custodian model for Bitcoin doesn't scale. So in the traditional financial system with, with banks and with your stockbroker or whatever, uh, the custodian model can work. You know, if somebody steals your credit card, for example, you call your bank and you say, hey, reverse those transactions and put those back in my account, and they do it. With Bitcoin, there is no reversing a transaction. And so when uh, something happens, like your Coinbase account gets hacked and your Bitcoin is stolen out of your account, there's really no recourse for that. And Coinbase, when this happens, has historically said, sorry, you're, you're SOL here. So as you start to see more of this happening, um, people on a broader scale, I think, will, will realize this. But it's our job to help them understand that faster. One of the things that um, I, I think has historically happened that people worry about is the, the exchange itself getting hacked. So that's like Mt. Gox, right? Um, or, or even there was, a, there was a hack with Binance like a couple of years ago where at the core cold storage level, a ton of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency was stolen from the exchange at once. I think we'll see less and less of that happening, especially with the more professional exchanges like Coinbase, to be just totally honest. But what people are really missing is just that their actual account becomes the single point of failure. Because you are not holding the keys, the only way to authenticate a Bitcoin transaction is if you log in with your username and password and tell Coinbase, hey, move this Bitcoin for me. Well, that means if somebody gets a hold of your username and password, they can tell Coinbase to move this Bitcoin for you, and then it's gone. And so um, that's really the reason why I think going forward, people need to be getting off of exchanges. But what's the alternative here is, is a wallet, right? And so you're holding your own keys, which is great. But the thing that we consistently hear people worry about when they're holding their own keys is, okay, I've got my Bitcoin on this mobile wallet or I've got it on a, a ledger. What happens if I lose this? You know, what, I, I've got a seed phrase, but I don't really feel good about that. And so I trust Coinbase more than I trust myself. And so that's something that we have to help solve because as we're seeing over time, the amount of Bitcoin that's actually being held by exchanges and custodians has increased significantly. So if you look like on this chart, the yellow is self-custody, the pink is lost Bitcoin, and the orange at the top is amount of Bitcoin that's held by custodians. So like that could be Coinbase, it could also be some of the um, institutional custodians like BitGo. And it's, as you can see there, it's, it's increased pretty significantly. And if you look at Coinbase's public filings, um, you can kind of estimate the amount of raw Bitcoin that they're holding because they report the dollar value of Bitcoin that they hold. And it's estimated to be about 2.4 million Bitcoin today out of the 21 million that Coinbase holds, which is pretty crazy, right? Like up to 60% of Bitcoin is estimated to be held by custodians today. And so when you think about this problem of executive order 6102, where the reason that was possible for the government to go and seize everybody's gold was because everybody was holding it in the banks. All they had to do was go up and knock on 10 banks doors and say, hey, give us all the gold in your vault, rather than going door to door to a bunch of people and, and you know, having individuals give that up. If more people are self-custodying Bitcoin, it makes the network as a whole much more resilient because it's just significantly harder to seize Bitcoin on a mass scale if you have to go around to individuals everywhere. So it's really on us as an early community of people who understand self-custody and, and feel comfortable using tools like hardware wallets to teach our friends and family how to do this as they get into Bitcoin. And so 
this kind of gets into what we are doing at CASA and how we're trying to make a difference here. So what we've done is tried to build human proof ways to hold your own keys. And so we are trying to protect people against themselves. They don't have to worry about making a mistake and losing all their money. They can actually hold their own keys without having that anxiety and that, that risk of loss. So the way that multi-sig works is that instead of just having one key holding your Bitcoin where you've got it on a ledger or whatever, you've got multiple keys protecting one pool of Bitcoin. And so this means that you lose one key, you don't necessarily lose all your money. So in this uh, screenshot that you can see here, this is from the highest security level in our product. And you've actually got five keys. So one key is on your phone, there's three keys on hardware wallets, and then there's one key that's held by CASA. And when you sign up for this, we actually send you the full package of hardware that you need, so you don't have to worry about that. But you only need three of these five keys to spend. So that means that in order to access your Bitcoin, you're approving it from a few different keys, but not all five. So you can actually lose two keys at the same time and not lose your money. And that gives people room to make a mistake, be a human, and you don't have to worry as much about you know, how you're going to uh, protect your funds over time. So what we've done is that's the highest security level that we offer, and that takes some effort to set up, right? And if you have, have $100 of Bitcoin, it doesn't make sense. Like you don't need to have that high of a security level. But we still want to have help as many people as possible to hold their own keys. So the approach we've taken with our product is to build um, different security levels that match the amount of value that you're actually holding. So at this lowest level on the very left here, it's super simple to set up a CASA mobile wallet and um, you're holding your own keys from the start, but it feels like you're using Coinbase. And I actually timed it out for fun the other day. How long does it take to set up CASA versus a Coinbase account? And it's 10 times faster, literally, to set up a CASA account than a Coinbase account. And that's because when you're setting up Coinbase, you're going through all of the KYC, you're uploading your ID, you're connecting your bank account, all of these things. And with CASA, it's very simple. You're just hitting a button, it's generating a key on your phone, and then it's saving that to your phone's secure element. So we get people in the door at these really simple, easy to use um, levels. And over time, as the value of their Bitcoin increases, they have the opportunity to increase and add a hardware wallet in and use a two of three multi-sig where you, know, you need two of the keys to spend. So this is how we've really tried to approach onboarding as many people as we can to holding their own keys. So just a quick, like what's the difference between CASA and some of the other DIY solutions out there? You know, the, the biggest difference is that we've made it incredibly simple to set up. One thing that we hear over and over again from our clients is, this was 10 times easier to do than I thought it would be, and I feel 10 times better about my Bitcoin security than I thought I would. And that's because we've really tried to bring in a team that'll support you. It's like a client service team who's there to help our customers with their setup, and also, think about some of the harder problems like inheritance. You know, when you're holding your own keys, it becomes a really big problem of what does my family do if I were to suddenly pass away because they definitely know, don't know how to use these things. And so that's how we can um, really come in and help there. So uh, that's enough of the CASA sales pitch. One of the things that I like to think about when I think about, you know, this question of is self-custody going to win? And will people hold their own keys? If you look at the history of the internet, it's a pretty clear trend that over time, very consistently, if you give people an ability to take responsibility into their own hands, they choose that. And they are willing to put up the effort in order to do that, in order to be more self-reliant. And so initially, you know, take some of these heavily monopolized very centralized industries like publishing and media, for example. 20 years ago, that was controlled by four cable news network companies and a few major newspapers. And then social media comes around, tools like Substack and blogging and makes it so that anybody can become their own publisher and suddenly individuals around the world become better news sources than the news themselves. 
Same thing with hotels and Airbnb, people being their own hotel, Ubers, taxis. The banking industry has been one of the most monopolized, centralized, and heavily regulated industries for hundreds of years because of the problems with money before Bitcoin was invented. And so now Bitcoin comes around and makes it so anybody can be their own bank. It's pretty clear to me that people will want this responsibility, already do want this responsibility, and it's our job to really help them do that before it becomes too late and too much Bitcoin gets aggregated in a old system. So that's it for me. If you want to sign up for CASA or check it out, we have a free trial. It's um, 30 days free, and you can also use the code Colorado for 10% off any plan. And I think Kit has a couple of things to close out with about the upcoming Bitcoin 2022. Thanks, Yeah, so I'm excited to tell you guys about the Bitcoin 2022 conference. It's going to be from April 6th to 9th in Miami. It's a four-day event. Uh, the first day is industry day, so this is going to bring like the Bitcoin ecosystem together. A bunch of um, corporations can network with each other. Um, and then we also have a pitch day as well, where startup companies can go and they can um, pitch for funding for their startup. Um, so that's all day one. The next two days, we've got full days of speakers um, at the Miami Beach Convention Center. It's going to be way bigger than last year. It can hold about 100,000 people. We're expecting 30,000 people this year. So super stoked on that. Um, just, to, you know, so you'll definitely get in and be able to see the speakers that you'd like. Um, two of the big speakers that we've announced so far are Michael Saylor and Adam Back so far, and we're going to be rolling out some more within the next few weeks. Um, we also, on the last day, have Sound Money Fest, and this is going to be campus-wide. Um, we're going to have music, artists, food, drinks, outdoor events, um, so it's going to be really great, too. Um, and yeah, um, the venue is going to be double-decker. We have three levels. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit about the passes. Uh, we've got four different passes, so general admissions will get you into the speakers. It won't be um, for the first day. If you want to do the first day with all the um, networking, also like a job fair and things like that, you're going to want to get the industry pass. Um, general admission will help you get into all the speakers, and then you'll also be able to go to uh, the Sound Money Fest. And if you just want to do the festival for the music, you can also buy a pass for that as well, too. And then we have the Whale Pass, which we're rolling out this week um, on our website, a page um, but that, that gets you into special events. Um, we have like go-karts that'll drive you around to different places, um, premium food, um, and you know, different areas where you can hang out with different whales. Um, and today, um, our biggest discount that we've given out so far is 25% off. So if you use the code Colorado um, on our website tonight, you guys can get that discount. And hopefully I'll see you guys in Miami. Thank you. <laughs> We can do some Q&A in case anybody has any questions. Okay, yeah, sure. You mentioned the inheritance. How does that work? That's something I've been really interested in lately. Yeah, so uh, the question was, how does inheritance work with CASA? So what we've done is because you have um, multi-sig and you have multiple keys in with a CASA setup, you can set it up so that um, your keys are access uh, the right number of keys, so three out of the five is where we currently offer it, are accessible through the estate legal system So after you pass away. So essentially this requires you to plan ahead of time and place these keys in the right places so that they're accessible by your heirs after if you should die. So what that means is like as uh, an example setup would be one's at your home, so your um, family knows that that's there. One could be held by um, like a safety deposit box that's accessible with a court order after you pass away. And then the last would be held by CASA and we'll actually sign with a, a court order for like a proof of death kind of thing. And so the 
benefits here is that your keys are, are accessible through the estate process and through the legal system. The downside is if you're trying to keep it, you read, you lose some of the privacy aspect. So like if you are trying to keep your Bitcoin super off grid, this, that's not maybe the way to, to go with it, but it does just give you a more kind of foolproof process to make sure that your assets get included in your broader estate plan. So the question is, when you're setting up a multi-sig, how do you advise folks to handle private key management, right? And so when you say that, what part of key management are you um, asking about specifically? Like a seed phrase or? Yeah. Yep. So specifically the question it's about seed phrases and what do you do with your seed phrases and so what we actually recommend as the default is that people at the three of five level get rid of most of the seed phrases except for one and that one is basically as a backup in case all of your electronic keys fail but these keys are on hardware wallets right and so the nice thing about a hardware wallet is that they have this built-in uh, protection it, it, against somebody just finding it and kind of being able to use it, right? Whereas with the seed phrase, if they find that, it's an unencrypted form of a key and they can just copy that down and you have no way of knowing that. And so what generally our, our clients do is they get rid of the seed phrases for all but one key. So if that seed phrase is found, they can't do anything because it's only one, um, but they aren't at risk of other seed phrases being found. now. This isn't like a requirement when you're using our product. Some people say, I know how to keep seed phrases safe. I want to keep all of them, and they're your keys. So you can do that. Um, but that's generally what we recommend. And, and the only reason you can do that with multi-sig, that, because you shouldn't do that with a normal key, is because you actually, a key is very replaceable in a multi-sig. And so if you lose a key, you don't have to worry about restoring it with a seed phrase. You just get rid of it. and rotate in a new key and, and you've, you're back to a full setup. Could you explain like the backup process of the, the three-tier wallet? Yeah, sure. So the question is, can you explain the how the free mobile key is backed up? So what we do is, generally we think seed phrases are confusing for people. And so we've said, in order to get this to be as simple uh, an experience as possible, we don't want the first thing you have to do when you sign up for CASA's free tier to be writing down a 24 word phrase. And so we generate the key on the phone and save it in the secure element. And then we take a, an encryption key from CASA's server and send it to the phone, encrypt the key, the, the private key on the phone so that it's now an encrypted private key and it's actually not useful in that form and then we upload that to Google Drive or iCloud for people. And so that means if somebody were to get access to your iCloud, you, uh, they would get an encrypted private key that's worthless. But if you lose your phone, you can log into iCloud and your CASA account on the new phone, and it'll pull down the key from iCloud, decrypt it with a key from CASA, and then you've got the, the private key saved on your phone again. So CASA and iCloud never see the private key, but, um, and so your phone is the only place that that's actually usable as a, as a um, unencrypted private key, but it makes it really easy for people to get started. Are you guys, uh, what do you guys do for like passwords? Do you guys like to try and get through all of that? Uh, yeah, so uh, question is, what are we doing about Taproot? And yes, I think that Taproot's gonna be awesome when it actually is ready. One of the things that I was actually talking with one of our engineers, Stacy, the other day, and she's been looking into this, and it looks like a Taproot, like native multi-sig won't be ready right when Taproot activates. There's a few other updates, I think, that have to be made in the uh, Bitcoin Core protocol in order to allow some of the benefits that you would get from um, Taproot with native multi-sig, and I think it's around signature ag aggregation. But 
Once that's actually live and in the protocol, which I would guess is sometimes next year, we'll be able to do some really cool things like, for example, um, Taproot, for anybody who doesn't know, is a upgrade to Bitcoin that lets you do more smart contracting with Bitcoin. So it lets you set more rules around the spending conditions for your Bitcoin. So what you can do, as an example, is say, okay, this is a two of three multi-sig, so there's three keys, I need two to spend. But if I don't move these funds for two years, make it a one of three multi-sig. And so what that would mean is all you needed was one of those keys to spend. And so if you lost one of your keys and weren't able, or two of your keys, for example, and weren't able to access your Bitcoin, without some of that smart contracting, you would have lost all your money. But with it, suddenly your wallet degraded in terms of security, but that allowed you to reaccess those funds. And so I think that there's some pretty interesting like use cases for that, especially around things like inheritance and making it so your heirs don't even have to try and access three of your five keys. They only need the one as long as they wait for five years or something like that. And so I think there's some pretty cool things that will come out of that. So I think if we're talking about shorter term, you know, some of the things that we're getting asked for by our customers is they're saying, hey, I've got, I really like Casa. I've got a bunch of my Bitcoin with Casa. And then I have some of my Bitcoin with BlockFi or some of these other financial service providers who I'm getting a loan on my Bitcoin uh, as collateral with, or I'm lending it out to earn yield legality of that's maybe questionable as the regulators are looking into it. But they're asking, can you get this into CASA so I can manage this all in one place? So probably some of the things that we'll be looking at over the next year are integrating some partners that can help bring that functionality to CASA clients, but all manageable from within CASA. So um, over a longer time frame, we really see private keys as the best form of digital authentication that we have today. So they, there's three kind of um, traits of a private key that are make it such a great form of authentication. So they're unique in that there is no other, once a private key is created, it, there's no other private key like it in the world. They are unguessable because they're super long and so it's really hard to guess somebody else's private key and it would take like a network of supercomputers millions of years to do that. And then they're unforgeable, which means that from the Bitcoin network's perspective, I cannot go to the network and fake that I have your key. So all of these things make private keys a super good form of authentication. And so over time, we think they will represent more than just money. So your private key will be your identity online. You know, why use a username and password when a signature from a private key is significantly better form of proving that you are who you say you are? Or in your communications, you already, people already use Signal today where they're encrypting their communication with a private key. So where we really see CASA as being the home for all of these keys that protect everything important in your digital life. And so over a long enough time frame, that's the direction that we're going in. Yeah, so we just, uh, question is, do we just support Bitcoin or do we support more than that? And we just support Bitcoin. Lightning, you said? We don't today, we used to with one of our other products and we're going to get back into that. Do we have any plans for supporting other tokens? Not right now. Um, we just see Bitcoin as the, like, it has won the money case, and it um, is the most decentralized form of sovereign money in the world. And so, our efforts are really focused there. Um, and especially as a small team, that's just something that 
we want to be focused where we can have the most impact. Yeah, so uh, the way that we encrypt it, I, this is a better question for our engineers, but I'm pretty sure we're using like a, a pretty standard key store to generate encryption keys on our end. And we generate a new key for each user account, and so we're then um, each user has their own unique encryption key that's stored on CASA's server. Um, I, I wish I could get into more technical details, but I don't know well enough, sorry. To answer the second question though, the user has the unencrypted key on their phone. And we've actually put in a lot of work to make sure that if CASA were to suddenly disappear overnight, you don't lose access to your Bitcoin. So um, you can actually test this out if you want to, but you can go into the CASA app and go to open up your mobile key details page and you can do an export of that key and it'll give you the seed phrase for the key. Um, and then what it does in the app is it marks it a, that key as um, exported or compromised so that you know, we no longer know what you're doing with that key, so we recommend that you rotate it out in the CASA app. But if CASA were to go down, that wouldn't matter, right? You just wanna take the key out and use it elsewhere. So we've built this so that you can actually do it in an offline standpoint where the app can't talk to CASA's servers. So you can go in your phone, put it on airplane mode and test this out, go into that key, export it. You're still able to export that key even if it's the phone has no internet access, meaning it can't talk to CASA's server. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for your time and um, hope you enjoy the pizza and beer. And I think we have this space for maybe like till 9 p.m. Is that right, Zach? Yeah, we have the space till nine. So feel free to hang out and thanks for coming. If you haven't registered for the giveaway, we're gonna be doing some giveaway of hardware wallets. Faraday bags, store your hardware wallets in, a free year of Casa Gold for one lucky person with a Faraday bag and hardware wallet, the whole darn thing. We're going to put a QR code up here on the screen. Uh, you'll be able to scan that to sign up for the giveaway. We'll do that in about 10 minutes. Stick around, get a beer, figure it out. Yep. 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 Yep.